All right, just looking one last time at the PowerPoint here, and looking at, at the trilobites, the gastropods, the bivalves, right? Brachiopods, bryzoans, the crinoids here, horn corals, the aminoids, and the graptolites, right? So your book does talk about these. And then um, I have an interesting fossil I want to show you uh, is one of a triceratops. And see this bone right here? It's a, it's a ball joint that holds a, the neck frill. So here's a big neck frill, which would be this thing here. And this bone occurs, basically it would connect to the spine back in here, right? So under this frill would be this ball joint here, right? So if we look at my um, fossil of that, I do have that, that fossil here of a triceratops. So this would be the, the ball joint and you can see some of the bone cells in here of a triceratops right so this uh, i got up in the colorado plateau and you can see some of these um some of the bone cells in the in this ball joint that would hold the the frill so this would connect to the spine going back this way and this would connect to the the, the neck frill or the head of the triceratops right so that's an interesting fossil um other kind of trace fossils. I have some interesting ones here. These are also from the Colorado Plateau. And these are interesting. They're, they're all polished stones. Um, and they're, they're often found in the tummy area of, uh, of, of, of fossil sauropods. And sauropods are the, um, the long neck dinosaurs. So often you find these pebbles in these sauropods. And one thing that we know, birds and dinosaurs are close related, right? And birds have a gizzard. Right, and so this would be stones from the these. In fact, they're these bones are called uh, gastroliths. These stones are called gastroliths. So stomach stone. So these were in the stomachs of a dinosaur, right? Breaking to helping to break down all the vegetation it was eating, right? And so modern birds also have a gizzard, and they do the same thing as well. So uh, gastroliths, pretty nice ones in here. Right, so now I want to transition to chapter 10, which discusses geologic time, and kind of some early figures, early people in the study of geology. Uh, an important one was a, a Civil War veteran, uh, John Wesley Powell, who, who explored the West. Really, he went down the Colorado River. No one had really done this before on these, on these wooden boats and had some catastrophes, but they all seemed to survive and come out, out, out the other end of the, of the river. But while he was riding, uh, rafting this river, uh, he, he, he had a famous quote. He was going down the Colorado uh, reading the pages of time because the strata, the rock layers, were, were giving him this information. And so when we think about time, time is kind of a difficult concept in geology. Uh, because um, it really sets geology apart from other sciences uh, because of this, this deep time. We, 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 we um, look at physical processes, physics, chemistry, but we, we relate them also to processes that occurred millions of years ago. Uh, uh, and so when geologists look at time, we're going to look at it in two ways. We're going to look at this relative time and think about this relative time as a, a sequence of events. So the relative time, you can order things. What came first, what came later. So you have to be sort of an accountant and use common sense detective rules to try to figure out what came, uh, uh, what unit came before the other, which one's older and which one's younger. The other one is absolute time. So absolute time is what you call a numerical age. And this one requires the atomic clock. And remember that atomic clock is based on radioactivity. So we'll cover both of those as we go along here. Then, kind of looking back a little bit, uh, we talked a little bit about James Hutton before. Remember, he's the one who pro proposed uh, uniformitarianism. Uh, but he sought natural explanations using physical laws discovered by Newton, right? Hutton noticed, noted that many features now frozen in rocks resemble modern features forming on the seashore, especially ripples. He would notice these petrified uh, ripples. So here's a good example. We see modern ripples on a shoreline, and then here in the Colorado Plateau, we see those same exact ripples, except these are lithified. They're, they've undergone that process of burial, compaction, cementation, a long history. So uh, it led Hutton to 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 
ponder, well, how old is the Earth? How long are these processes? And as we go along here, you know, that, that brought him to this concept or this principle of uniformitarianism. Physical processes that operate in the modern world also operated in the past. And so uh, Hutton envisioned uh, the Earth to be cyclical. There, were these, there was uh, uh, uplift of mountains, erosion of mountains, uplift of mountains. Ero so cycl he, did, he really didn't see an end. In fact, he had a, he had a famous quote as well. Uh, Hutton's quote was, uh, uh, in terms of geologic time, no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. The next important figure is Charles Lyell. And in 1830, he published his book, Principles of Geology. We mentioned him a little bit, especially in regard to Darwin. Uh, but he took uh, a lot of the work that Nicola Steno and Hutton had used and set the framework for modern geologists. In fact, Lyell is important in that he truly was a, uh, uh, the first geologist, a professional geologist. Uh, uh, Hutton was more of a of a uh, of a wealthy uh, gentleman and 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 um, and a writer, whereas uh, uh, I remember Steno was mostly a, a, an anatomist, and so um, with this framework, he's in, he he brought forward uh, and published this book uh, 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 and brought forward these principles for relative time dating. So I call these the principles for relative time dating. So. We've already discussed uniformitarian. The ones I want to focus on are these uh, uh, here, in, which include superposition, original horizontality, lateral continuity, these cross-cutting relations, inclusions. Your book has one, a new one that I don't really um, use too much, and that's bait contacts, right? And there's also one that uh, I think I have, have coming up here in the next page, but I want to add it here. And that's going to be the the uh, principle of of fossil succession. It's fossils to give us uh, uh, an idea of the age of of um, of geologic units, time in terms of relative and absolute time. And uh, we'll look at these relative time principles first. And that first one is superposition. And basically, superposition says that that rock units in a layered sequence of sedimentary rocks. Sorry, younger at the top and older at the bottom. So in this case, the Grand Canyon, the Kaibab Formation is going to be younger than the Coconino Sandstone, right? So that's, that would just make sense. Is that how do we know that the strata have not been overturned? Faulting, uh, tectonic tilting, uh, uh, folding mountain building can, can take horizontal flatline strata tilt them and even maybe flip them upside down, right? And so uh, in this picture, this is uh, some of the students I took uh, uh, last semester out to Marin Headlands, and you see a series of charts. Well, how do we know uh, it, because this, this series, this strata is, is tilted very steeply, how do we know that these strata uh, are, 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 which way is up? Is up going this way or is up going downwards? Here my students are lying along the, the dip angle of the strata here, right? So which way is up, this way or that way? And there are some techniques we use to determine that um, paleo up direction. So some of the things we use, one of the things we use are, are ripples, right? Ripples, and the thing about ripples, always on top, right? So those ripples, if we see them, this indicates sort of water back and forth, oscillating ripples like at a shoreline, that we, we know that the, the, the top would be uh, uh, in this direction. So we call that paleo up. Uh, the other one we use are cross beds, right? So we talked about cross bedding and cross beds. So we know that in sequences of cross beds, remember the bottoms are tangential. They approach the bottom, whereas the tops are cut off or truncated. So in this case, uh, we would see a feature like this, right, where the cross beds are all coming, sloping down to the bottom, and then this would be our paleo up. And then the next one that we use uh, are the graded beds. And just common sense for the graded beds, like the turbidites, we're always going to see a sequence where uh, we're going to see coarser particles at the bottom, and then as we go up the sequence, we're going to see finer particles, right? So we go from this coarse on the bottom to finer as we go toward the top. So each one of these is a turbidite, right? It represents a different event, like a, 
like an, uh, a turbidity current or, or an avalanche flow. So here's our graded beds where this is going to be the, the paleo up again. Right? And so, and then there's some other ones. Uh, we also have the, um, uh, and your book mentions this, and I know there's a quiz question on it. It's these, the, they call them soul marks. Either um, something that's, uh, so if you're like in a, in a river here, and this is the, the bed of the river, and so let's say there is a cobble or, or a boulder moving down the river here. Let's say the current's moving this way. And this, this boulder or cobble bounces uh, uh, along the bottom of the bed, the stream bed. It's going to leave a little impact mark here, right? little impact mark. And so when you look at, at um, the bottoms of beds, the, so, the soul marks, right? Uh, the soul marks, you'll, you'll see that the, the indentations will always be pointing up. But the, the, the bottoms of the bed will have these protrusions, right? So this would be the bottom, and then the top would have this indentation. So I think I showed you a diagram like that as well. And then uh, finally, the, uh, another important one, number five, are, is one called mud cracks. And for mud cracks, we know when we have desiccation in, in a pond or a, a, a little um, a mud puddle, when all that water evaporates, you get this polygonal cracking, right? And but those cracks, because there's con there's contraction on the surface, there'll always be these little little cracks or V's that point down, right? So those are the cracks because there's shrinkage up here. Uh, you'll make this little V pattern. So this would always be the the paleo up. So using mud cracks can can help us uh, determine. Uh, paleo up directions, right? So those are some of the things we'll use. We'll use ripple marks, cross beds, graded beds, soul marks, and mud cracks. Another principle that's that's uh, ascribed that w was first discussed by um, by Steno was uh, the principle of original horizontality, right? So in sedimentary rock strata that's that's formed usually is always going to be formed horizontally. If we see it tilted, that means something's happened to it, right? So, so usually flat-lying strata is going to be uh, younger than strata adjacent to it that's tilted, right? Because whatever tilting event tilted that other strata occurred before the horizontal strata was laid down. And then this principle of lateral continuity, we don't really use too much, but it just refers to geologic units at some point pinch out right there they we, like for example in the if you go to the colorado plateau right we got these kaibab limestones coconino uh, sandstones a big red wall down here the supai formation we don't see those in california what happens to them well the environment changes right there's different environments uh so either the the environment changes and these units pinch out and other units take over or uh, uh, the deposition occurs within a sedimentary basin, right? So uh, that's the principle of lateral continuity. And then as we go along here, uh, Lyell introduced uh, a couple of principle, principles in his book, Principles of Geology. And one of them is this principles of inclusions, right? And the principle basically states that the inclusion, here's some inclusions, will always be older than the host because they've been included. So this inclusion is older than the host. So is the principle of cross-cutting relations. And this one's important is in that um, uh, the, the younger unit always crosses, uh, cr uh, crosses the older unit. So the younger unit will penetrate and cross the older unit. For example, here are a series of strata. There's some limestone, sandstones, another limestone conglomerate here, a breccia it looks like. And so the granite cuts across that, across. So this contact right here, this dark line is a contact. It's called an intrusive contact. And so this context is telling us that the granite came later. It's younger than the strata here. But then we have this erosion surface up here. So the erosion cuts across the granite. So the erosion is younger than the granite. So that's another way of looking at these cross-cutting relations, right? Thank you.